it's so good to have you um, on this little gold cast. We've been planning it for quite a while, haven't we? We've been sort of back and forth. Like we have. To... And I've been so rubbish at keeping in contact, so really apologise. So it's good, it's good to have you on. Oh, it's um, good to be here. First and foremost, how's lockdown been for you? Oh, it's... Well, it's been good and bad. Good in the sense that uh, during lockdown one, I basically recorded the album, which kept me busy for a good nine months, which is fantastic. You know, I had really something to work on. And then releasing the album, that was another few months, you know, getting it out there. Um, and then after that, I think the real downer was that I wasn't able to um, kind of have an album launch performance or yeah. you know a big party or you know this is like the biggest thing I've ever done in my life and I couldn't really share it in person with anyone and obviously being a also a gigging working musician I'm a sax player and a singer and I play with uh, function bands and stuff like that and I do my own stuff um, not being able to perform at all during lockdown has been really it, it has been tough but you know, you got to find ways to keep yourself positive. And um, we've been doing a lot of writing, my writing partner and I, we, mm -hmm. um, we're partners in life as well. So oh, nice. yeah, does that have, it, does that have its, uh, its complexities as well? Obviously, in lockdown, you've kind of 24 seven with someone. Yeah, you're writing songs and that as well. How difficult yeah. was that? Well, it's, it's, I think it's good, because because we're so close, I can be, and he can be completely honest um, with each other without having to be like polite or say it in a polite way or just be like, no, that sucks. Or like, no, that's terrible. Or why would you even think to do that? Sometimes it can get heated, but I think 90% of the time it's actually quite, um, quite a good chill process. Yes. Nice, nice. Yeah. Well, let's, um, let's kind of start at the beginning then. Um, sure. So obviously, Sandra A. Lux, you were born in Canada. I was. Um, tell us a bit about the area where you, you kind of grew up in and what was life like, you know, growing up in that, in that area with family and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. So my parents are immigrants from Holland, so I grew up speaking Dutch. Um, and they settled in an area called Richmond. And actually, if this is Richmond, it's even a smaller fishing village outside of Richmond called Steveston. Yeah. Um, not, not very many. It's not a huge place. It's, it's a very, very small kind of fishing community. Literally, you have like a fisherman's wharf. And, and I, that's where I grew up. It was quite idyllic to live as a child because there was always lots to do. I have a brother. Um, wonderful to grow up um you know having a, a live-in playmate as well yeah. and uh yeah that's kind of where i grew up in the in 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 canada yeah, on the west were, coast were, you, were your parents and and um your brother or, or friends were they were they from a kind of a musical background as well no not at all they were i'd say my parents no offense to them they're they're gourmands of music so Luckily, I had this amazing uncle. Um, his name is Uncle Bob. And he was the one. He was the cool uncle. And he would always bring uh, like hip CDs um, as presents every time he came over to the house. Stuff like Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin, Blood, Sweat and Tears, like fantastic music. Um, and so I grew up listening to sort of that stuff. Um, my parents just put on anything that they had. And luckily, he brought some fabulous music so were it not for him maybe you'd be speaking to someone else right now <laughs> so you were brought up on kind of the the harder side of of, of music uh not not so much on the the jazzy sort of soulful tip where you're you're kind of synonymously known um you must have then sort of progressed to playing or singing or even buying music Let's, let's talk about buying music because obviously buying music is is my forte yes of course um, what, what what was what was um the first track you bought it wasn't a it wasn't a track it was a it was a cd um yeah. <laughs> so i was a big oh well, yeah so that's, that's i guess that's the that's the different the difference in age between yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're of the cd age yeah <laughs> uh -huh. 
I'm of the vinyl age, and oh. unfortunately, I still buy it, Sandra. Do you know? What oh, I mean? that's fabulous. I mean, I have a whole record player, and I'm an I have like a whole audiophile set up here. So yeah, that's. But when I was growing up, obviously, we didn't have a a record player. We had a CD player because that was the modern thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I was a big rap fan when I was younger. Really? Um, yeah, and I listened to my favorite rappers were like Dr. Dre, Eminem. Yeah. Uh, Nelly even um, he was great he had nice hooks and uh, so my first album was an Eminem CD which was Marshall Mathers yeah um, and I was uh, how old was I well I was a kid and I had saved up all this money this pocket money and I'm like oh my gosh so I went into the city with my money and I uh, went up to HMV, which um, I don't know if they had them here. It's like a music, they sell music, or they did back in the day. And I, I put all my coins on the table and I said, I want this, I want this CD. And it had that explicit sign on it, obviously. And um, I had to get my dad to say, hey, dad, I really like this CD. He, luckily he didn't know what he was saying yes to. <laughs> then I brought it home to my mom and my mom found it. And she's like, oh, you're not listening to this. This is terrible music. <laughs> I snuck it to school once and I was the coolest kid in school. We all huddled together and listened to it. I was the coolest kid in school for about five minutes until my mom found it. And um, she actually, heartbreakingly, she broke it. In front no, of me. no, yes. I don't have no. it anymore. I know, harsh, hardcore. <laughs> That's harsh. I mean, it's difficult in this day and age as well. Particularly, I think, I think rap music and, and um, the likes is kind of. I don't think there's any track you can actually buy now that doesn't have profanity or some sort of yeah swearing in it. It's very, very difficult. Very Except difficult. for That's Will Smith. The early days of it. Will Smith is pretty clean. Will Smith, yeah. I have to say, is pretty polite in his yeah. rapping. <laughs> but it's rare though, isn't it? I found I found that sort of back in the day, sort of when, when I was buying it in sort of like the 80s and stuff, mm. there was less swearing and, and profanity in there. They actually had real things to talk about, whereas yes. these days, I don't think they do so much now. No. So I've been going back to people like Common and it's like, wow, it's a real story. And I can see what you're seeing right now. It's just beautiful. You know, it's beautiful yeah. storytelling. Yeah. yeah, there are some good some good artists out there at the moment. There are some. Mm. But I find it very difficult with some of the, the lyrical content uh, yeah. to understand and where they're coming from. So yeah. where would you say um, that, that kind of real love and passion of music first sort of started? What sort of age were you at then? Well, my mum said that I sang before I spoke. Um, really? She, she'd play CDs in the car and she'd like, she said that I would sing along with it perfectly in pitch and even when she turned it off I would remember the melodies so obviously I don't remember doing that but um yeah from a very 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 early age I I uh, really really enjoyed singing and playing piano so that's some of my earliest memories is tinkling on a on a piano and um I had one of those Playmobil um tape recorder toy ones but they really worked and you put a tape and you could record your voice oh, and yeah. that was my favorite toy you know, I would sing little songs into it. I'd record and sing and I'd listen. And I think that's kind of where the love and passion of performing and recording kind of started from, like as a six-year-old even. At six, and how, and how did that progress to something a little bit more sort of serious? Yeah, so um, my parents split up when I was nine years old and it was quite, um, it was quite abrupt. Uh, we lost literally everything and had to start from absolute zero, everything zero. Like you can't even like zero, zero, zero and uh, or less than. Um, so I had to restart my life, restart a new school, restart like everything. And as a child, you know, that's quite traumatic I I bet, think, yeah. to happen. And um, I think that's when I really saw music as a refuge and um, a place where I could perhaps express the emotions I was feeling um, instead of you know, talking about it, which is hard for a child. Um, I could express it through music, either listening to it or performing it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's- Music is always the answer. It, can, it can make the dullest of days turn into something beautiful, I found. Absolutely, absolutely. Takes you to, takes you to another place. Definitely. So, 
So you, you mentioned playing the piano and stuff. Was that something that was self-taught or did you have to go and get any specific training for that? Well, I was, uh, I'm a, started off as an ear player so I could hear a melody and play it on the piano and my mom really? realized that and she's like, oh, well, maybe you should take some lessons. And I gave her an ultimatum and I said, I'm not doing that Royal Academy shite. You know, I, I, I don't want to play, no offense to Royal Academy players, it's just not my jam. You know, I'm not going to yeah. sit there and learn friggin' scales that I don't care about. You know, I want to play music. I want to play music. So I said, I'll do piano lessons if I can do um, jazz or blues piano. And that's kind of when I started as a seven year old, I started my first piano lessons. Really? And then at age 11, I started sax lessons. Um, so yeah, it was all kind of, it started, started early. I guess I can thank my mom for seeing that I had some potential and, and um, yeah. Well, I saw on your blog that you kind of described as a, a multi-instrumentalist, a multi instrumentalist What else do you play then? I play guitar, um, piano. I play percussion, like Brazilian percussion. I play. Um, I can. I can. I can play a little bit of bass. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I play. Yeah. I think it's incredible. I always. It's. I've never ever had a passion to play a, a, a musical instrument other than probably when I was at school. I'd mess around a little bit, but I never had a desire to be. Um, a producer or, or you know as creative as that but I love playing music a lot yeah. I ultimately love playing music yeah so when you when you sort of started playing all these different instruments and then pro progressed to a, a, a band I presume you know what where did that sort of you know that learning of playing different instruments take you where did it take me um so in high school that's kind of where it all culminated I I, my, I had a fantastic guitar teacher. I, um, I was also self-taught. Um, I was extremely bullied, like horrifically bullied in high school. Oh, really? And, oh, yeah, that's horrible. That's not horrible. good times. I know. That's Anyone who's different, you know, God forbid you're different, yeah. you know. And, it's okay to be different. I know. So that's terrible. Uh, it's, it's okay. It's, it, you know, I, I actually want to thank them because without that, I wouldn't have had the passion um, and the pain um, to be able to perhaps play it. So for example, guitar, because I wanted to escape, I just kind of came home and tinkled on guitar and I'd looked and like three hours had passed. And for me, that was a therapy. And the same with saxophone, you know, thank goodness for after school jazz quartet and, you know, and all this stuff and jazz combo and and uh, the extracurricular music because that was, that was my escape. And um, so I started really performing in high school. I have to thank my wonderful music teacher, Jeremy Hapner, who is no longer with us. Um, God rest his soul. Yeah. Um, without here, I, I literally probably would not. Without him, I, I might not be here. He was, uh, he basically saved my life through music. And I have him to thank for putting me on my first stage and kind of just pushing me on and, and saying, wow. And me being like, holy crap, people can do this for, you know, almost a living. This is, I love this. Yeah, I love it. So when you, when you did your first, your first gig, what was your thought process? How did you feel about actually going up in front of people? Bearing in mind, you were someone that got bullied, bearing in mind you'd gone through the trauma of your, your parents breaking up. What was your, what were your, what were your sort of confidence levels like at that time? When I was on stage, I felt like none of that was an issue, if you know what I mean. That wasn't me anymore. I wasn't the bullied girl. I wasn't the, you know, the girl from a broken home. I wasn't the girl, you know, with, you know, depression and anxiety. Anxiety. It just kind of washed away, and all that mattered was the music. The music right here Lovely. and right now. And music is kind of, it is, it's, it's kind of, it, it brings you home. It centers you and. I don't see that I own my talent. To me, it's it's kind of spiritual in a way, mm -hmm. not to be too woo woo, but I feel like I'm just a conduit through which maybe music happens and you have to be- You were chosen, good. Sandra, you were ah! chosen. <laughs> well, I was you lucky. Were blessed. Yes, I am very, I'm, I am very blessed. And I'm blessed to be able to 
um, be able to record the music and, and share it with the world, which is amazing. So was there, um, were there any sort of big influences, apart from obviously you mentioned your, your old uh, your school teacher, mm. um, who would you say were, or yeah, were your, big, were your biggest influences in, in sort of going up and performing? I absolutely loved um, Aretha Franklin and um, Etta James, um, Stevie Wonder, um, Michael Jackson, um, Astrid Gilberto. She, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's yeah. that yeah Brazilian. Brazilian, um, nice. yeah, that played a lot with, uh, sang a lot with Stan Getz. So I had both of that, you know, all oh, the tenor sax sound of Stan Getz. Um, yeah, so kind of people like that um, kind of started off. Oh, also, I, I really enjoyed, obviously, the jazz. So, like, the Dexter Gordons and Hank Mobley's and, you know, kind of the, uh, the jazz, the jazz sax players. They, they also really influenced me. And to this day, um, I don't know if you can hear it, but is there's some jazz chord influences definitely in the music. <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, I, I kind of, that moment in the Sun track, I, I've, I kind of stumbled up, across that track, actually. And oh, that lifted me and then I thought I need to research Sandra May a little bit more and, and I found some more music and then your album came out and the album for me had, it had kind of um, brand new heavy type undertones that's how yes. it kind of felt to me that sort yes. of acid jazz feel mm -hmm. because that era was a, a pretty pivotal and large um, point in time for me um, and there was some really, really good music around at that time that came out on Talking Loud and and so on. And, and so I, I felt that that was kind of the sort of basis of where your 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 music kind of uh, it kind of sat in that in that in that space really. And that's mm -hmm. all. I, and I, I just thought she's she's great, great voice, great melodies, and um, you know, the, like you say, the construction, the music, the production, it, it all just came together perfectly. Just loved it. Oh, Absolutely loved you. the album. It's got a very summery feel to the album too. Yes, shiny. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so, like, you know, if we go back to the the performing, was there was there a, a a big a big performance that that stood out for you that sort of made you think, right? I think I think I know what I'm doing now. Standout performance. Um, because there have been so many. I've never been in front of like 10,000 people. And I, I, I hope one day I'll be able to experience that. I'm sure um, you will. Yeah, there's this festival that um, I used to play every year in Canada in the interior, it's very, very hot place in the summertime. And um, it's called Peach Fest. And it's, uh, there were about, I don't know, a thousand people kind of with all their lawn chairs and things kind of, and we came on and the sun was setting and it was just absolutely a stunningly perfect evening. And then we started playing, you know, some Tower of Power stuff and everyone just started to get up and dance. And um, I was playing Barry Sachs for that and um, doing backing vocals. And I looked out and saw all of these people just absolutely digging it and just having a great time and the sun and the lake and the and it was just it was like magic you know it was magic so I think that was that's that was definitely a highlight performance for me that sounds like did it sounds good yeah sounds like, we could, sounds like um there's a Sandra May Lux um a a concert in the in the horizons in the UK perhaps yeah as a freedom as a freedom party Yes, <laughs> definitely. So tell, if we take a little step back mm -hmm. to um, obviously playing the music, singing, I've always been really fascinated with songwriters and how they find their lyrics. You mentioned that uh, you and your partner, you, you, you write together, but I would imagine before you got together, you were writing on your own. How, how did you sort of train yourself to do that? that well, I did, I did go to uh, music school. Um, I went to music college um, for five years. So that did help me get like the basics of how to put a song together, write chord changes, write charts for a band, arrange a song, blah, 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 blah. So I was very lucky I had all these wonderful tools. Um, and then my um, learning how to, 
you know, I have to say that I don't write as good lyrically um, uh, by myself as I do with with Alan, my writing partner. Um, I think we, I think a lot of the best writers, not to say that I'm, you know, one of the best writers, but I think a lot of fantastic writers, um, people like um, Carol King and Jerry Goffin, um, Elton John, Bernie Taupin, like these are people who write together. And um, I think writing with someone who brings out the best in you and vice versa is, is super important not to be too precious about anything actually during the yeah. songwriting process is important. So um, our process, um, we basically start with like a big idea. So here's the thesis statement of what I want. So let's say, oh, I want to write about um, a breakup, like um, this breakup that I had, you know, and then we'll do a question and answer kind of thing. He'll ask me questions or I'll ask him questions and he'll go away and make some notes and come back. And then through those lyrics that he writes, a vibe will emerge, a feel will emerge. I'll sit at the piano. He'll throw the lyrics at me. Um, and then something will come out. And I, and honestly, this is where the woo woo-ness comes. I, I actually Imagine. can't describe to tell, I can't describe to you how sometimes it just, they just fall out most of the time. I can't quantify exactly how I write a song. It, um, a lot of the times it, 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 it writes me, if you see what I mean. So you've either got it or you haven't got it. There's well, a little. You, you may, maybe you can't teach songwriting, but you can definitely yeah. learn it. Yeah. And the only way to learn it is by doing it and doing it and doing it and doing, see what works, see what doesn't work, so. And Absolutely. I think it's really important to be like super specific because a lot of the lyrics I find these days are just kind of about nothing or, or don't really have much to say. And I think it's really important to be specific in what you have to say. Yeah. yeah. But no, I do. I find, I find um, songwriting extremely fascinating. I mean, some of the tracks, I, I listen to a lot of older music. But I, I mean, I don't know what, what you listen to i'll ask you that question what, what what are you listening to right now oh my god um i love donny hathaway i think oh, wow. he's an angel he's he he has a one in a billion voices that that guy you can just hear the pain and you yeah. can hear the oh the passion in his voice it was just brilliant and he was a brilliant arranger as well amazing keyboard player too yeah, so things like him and um, who else am I? Earth, Wind and Fire, one of my favorites. Doobie oh, Brothers, yeah. um, Steely Dan. Um, yeah, a lot of soul. Yeah, Etta James, of course. Still listening to her, of course. Yeah, yeah Amy Winehouse. Yeah, Jacob Collier. I think he's doing some very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you? What, who, who are you listening to right now? For me, for me right now, I've actually, I've actually found, I do listen to a lot of the older music. I love my Marvin. Oh, um, I love my Are I love my Aretha. I love my James Brown. But I'm I'm trying to listen to a little bit more newer stuff at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of my my uh, my my show on on Gold Dust Radio kind of reflects that a little bit as we're trying to sort of break a few of the newer artists or the lesser known artists. And give yeah. Them that platform. So I've been some good discoveries lately. Yeah. A lady called Lady called Maya Gold is the most recent one that I was listening to. Very very good sort of neo soul album. Um, so yeah, and, and and conversely, there are artists like Children of Zeus that I really I really think their music is is excellent. Rap music and they fuse it with jazz and they fuse it with R and B. They they are they are kind of creating a little bit of a niche I think on, on their own. So I have that I have that on playback quite a bit in the car and stuff. So, oh, so fantastic! Recommended, recommended if you if you haven't indulged in a bit of Children of Zeus, Sandra. Yes, but very good. But um, I'll I'll give you a, a little bit of a fun question, I suppose. Um, whilst gigging, yeah, what would you say? It could be, it could be. You could look at it and laugh now, but at the time it was probably disaster. <laughs> what was the worst thing I ever happened to you whilst performing live? Oh my god! Well, it wasn't while, but it was during my break. Does that count? So, uh, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Okay. Okay. So I'll allow that. I'll allow that. 
we were playing this club in Vancouver and it was Halloween and it was full. You could not move. Like it was full, full, full. Um, I was playing with the soul funk uh, cover band. I was playing Barry Sax and Barry, Sa Barry saxophone is, is huge. Like it is huge. It is a massive instrument. And most of the time during the break, I'll put it on my stand and then I'll go and have a beer or something, have a break. So I put it on the stand, all was good. And I thought uh, everything was fine. So I came back, put, a, put you know, my sax on and we started playing a tune and I tried to blow a note and nothing came out. Like literally nothing came out. I was like, oh my goodness, what, what is going on here? What is happening here? So I keep trying, I keep trying, I keep, keep trying to make a sound and something was very, very, very wrong. And um, so I run to the bathroom. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is wrong? Like this, there's gonna be so much money to fix and I have to finish this show and blah, 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 blah. And so I run to the bathroom and I see that one of the pads had fallen out. Oh no. And one pad can just, you're done. Like the sax just doesn't work. I found that pad. I asked management for um, electrical tape and these four lovely drunk ladies in the bathroom helped me tape it back together to get through the gig. And um, so I went back on stage. I hobbled through to the end of the gig and someone had told me that during the break, someone knocked over my saxophone and didn't tell me. And that's how that happened. So oh. the repairs were like $600, which wasn't fun, but um, we got through the gig. So that is, that is like a nightmare situation for, I think any musician, you know, can understand. And you managed to get back on stage on time as well. I did, I did, yeah. So that heart was, you get that really hot feeling, don't you? Oh God, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your your worst moment when performing live. Um, let's yeah, we stay on. Let's stay on the uh, on the on the on the live performing. Um, I always I always look at the performers on stage, and they always look like they're obviously enjoying themselves. What do you enjoy about performing live most of all? I think again, it's about leaving, kind of being in the moment and, and communicating with, with the band um, and playing off each other, you know, listening to each other and trying to create something bigger than all of us put together, better than all of us put together. And um, the power of feeding off an audience is just, um, it's kind of like this concentric eight, you know, the infinity it's, you yeah, know, yeah. I give and they give back to me. And it's just this wonderful kind of dance with the audience um, that makes it alive, you know, that keeps the music alive. I yeah. like that. that's a good way of explaining it. I like that, that uh, eight analogy. Yeah. It very much is like that when you're playing music, it, it very yeah. much does feel that way. You need to, you need to get something back, don't you? Yes, yes. That's why I find like the live streaming stuff must be so difficult and I haven't done any of that. Just, it's just too hard without any, anything, you know, to, to grab on to, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit here, Sandra. Oh God. Because I'm gonna ask you to pick a track that really stands out as your favorite track of all time or something that really sort of says what Sandra May Lux is about. I think After the Love Has Gone by Earth, Wind and Fire is probably one of the greatest songs ever written and oh, one wow, of the greatest wow. songs ever executed. It's just, it's perfection in a song. It really is. From beginning to end. Yeah. It's just, it doesn't put a foot wrong. It really doesn't. And I could listen to it 10 times in a row. I would not be bored. <laughs> yeah. It's just, uh, it's brilliant. Maurice, Maurice White and... Um, the, the, like, come on, <laughs> you know, David Foster wrote the song and, and uh, yeah, no, it's just a brilliant, brilliant tune. Brilliant, brilliant song. So but they've, done, they've done so many. You could just go through that back oh. and keep going. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you on that one. That's yeah. a beauty of a track. Yeah, it's special. It's very special. It's a beauty. Um, let's talk about 
your first album, Happily Ever Now. Yep. Tell me about how that all came together. Oh, I was, again, I was very, very lucky that I found the right producer at the right time who knew the right musicians, who knew the who direction. Who was the producer on the album? Uh, Gil Sang, brilliant producer. Um, he produced um, some of Amy Winehouse, um, Michael Jackson, and he produced uh, Shauna Scoffrey most recently. Um, and he kind of knew exactly, you know, what I wanted, what my vision for the album was. And he's like, okay, I, I think I got that. You know, I, I know a guy like he's is like, he, he is knew he from that. the UK. Is he signed? Yeah, up? yeah, yeah. He's a Londoner. Mm -hmm. He's a Londoner. I mean, let's take a little, a tiny little step back. Cause obviously yep. you came from Canada, what, 2017? Yep. How was that transition for you? And what, what made you decide, right, I need to be in England? So basically I'd been kind of bumming around, not bumming around, working in Vancouver, gigging here and there and kind of working in a, in a music shop part time. And I thought, wow, you know, the problem with Vancouver is that it's so beautiful. And so um, it's such an idyllic place to live that you can kind of find yourself stuck there if you're not careful. And so I looked around, and I thought, oh my gosh, like if I don't, do something or go somewhere or, you know, I'm going to be stuck here forever. Um, and unfortunately, Vancouver doesn't have a, a huge music scene. Um, so that was kind of one of the reasons why, well, kind of the main reason. So I met my partner, Alan, and he said, well, why don't you come with me to do Edinburgh in 2017? And we don't come back. And I had never been. <laughs> and we don't come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, you're on. <laughs> I will take that bet. And because uh, in the end, it's like, you know, I'm young enough, like big deal. If I don't like it, I can crash on my mom's couch until I find my feet. It's not a big deal. Um, and when I landed in the UK, I felt home. That's all I can explain it. It, it. it felt like home. It felt like I, yes, this is absolutely the right place and the right people. And um, luckily Alan had lived here for a while. So he kind of tapped back into his network of people and friends. And I kind of was adopted into this, you know, London group of wonderful people that I was very lucky. I was very lucky to kind of, again, right place, right time. So I'm so grateful to, the UK kind of opening their, you know, their arms to me and, yeah. and kind of embracing what I had to offer. I've got some friends that have recently moved to Vancouver. Oh yeah. Very you know, recently. And, and the pictures that my friend, I'll, I'll give his name, Tom Ginelli, he's a, he's a DJ producer. Yeah. Um, he, he sends me, well, he sends, he posts some beautiful pictures on uh, on social media so uh, it does look a beautiful place it is actually. absolutely stunning place to visit yep a hundred percent hundred percent so so you so you made it to the uk and you you, you mentioned you met uh your producer uh gil yep and and uh what happened next so basically i came to him with all these demos of my songs like which were just basically piano and voice and uh, of course, because he's such a, a great producer, he, he, he saw the potential, he heard the potential in them and he said, okay, I got a band for you. And um, we, we recorded this uh, in, in a very funky studio in North London called um, Boogie Back. And it's basically a terraced house, which had been, each room had been converted like into part of this studio. And uh, yeah, we got the bed tracks in four or five days and then lockdown happened so we had to like sneak in and and I had to drive or get Alan to drive me up to North London for two three weeks to lay vocals and overdubs and backing vocals and all of that so and then he took it away and uh mixed it and then Michael Sergen uh mastered it he's <laughs> incredible mastering engineer just did a brilliant job we got percussion overdubs and some horns. I, I played some horns as well. 
And so that's kind of, that's kind of the process really. Yeah. And all in all, you know, from start to finish is about nine months. So nine months. So the yeah. tracks, the tracks that went into that album, you, you had, you'd already written most of that. Yes. Yeah. Before, before yeah. You, uh, you, you got into the studio and stuff. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah, that's not including the writing, you know, and, and me writing charts for the band. Yeah. I would say, I would say that's quite quick. Yeah. Or would that be my, 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 my lack of knowledge of songwriting? Um, I mean, those songs we had written, I don't know, years. Some of them had been years just sitting there, you know? Yeah. We did shake some of them out and say, okay, we need to funk this one up or we need to, you know, push this one another way. And, and uh, yeah, so it, it was... Was it, was it a difficult process choosing the tracks? Uh... Mm, sort of but because I we collaborated with my producer with Gil and he chose he's like okay and we wanted it to be a cohesive story right so it really we wanted it to be a whole story and and so it kind of the tracks kind of chose themselves in the end and and uh I think they were definitely the right tracks for the album it must have it must be difficult because like you know you know when you've got a wardrobe full of clothes that you've got some you've got real sort of like sentimental. Yes. <laughs> You're a bit sentimentalist. You don't want to get rid of certain things. Yeah. You know they have to go. Yeah. I would have thought, I would have thought choosing an album would be, choosing the tracks in an album would be a little bit like that. I really want to have that one, but I can't have that one, but I'm going to keep it anyway, or no, that one's got to go. There are are definitely, there were definitely some of those moments. Absolutely. And luckily yeah. I feel like my producer's like, no, nope, you know, and, and that's great. Okay. You just have to make a decision, make a decision. Yeah. So it was good. So what, what did it feel like when it was all, it was, it was done, when it was completed? Oh, it was, it was like one of the best feelings in the world. It was my life's work. Now an actual thing, you know, a cohesive yeah thing and then when I got the actual CDs it was like I can hold this in my hand this is like this is the greatest feeling it was like having a baby kind of you know I've had my my first and it's a it's a wonderful feeling it's just a, a very very much a sense of accomplishment and the teamwork and effort that all went into it was just um yeah it was yeah incredible incredible so what was What's that um, that marketing machine like then, Sandra? So you've got your product, you've got your yeah. album done, and then you some, you somehow got to get it out there for people to to listen to it. How does that work? So I worked with a radio plugger to get, um, and luckily, I guess people really uh, dug it because it got a ton of uh, a ton of, of radio play, which is um, I'm very very grateful for. And uh, yes, thank you, Dina. <laughs> thank you. And can I just take this opportunity to honestly thank you and thank DJs like you because without you, our music wouldn't go anywhere and it wouldn't be out there and people wouldn't hear it. So I'm truly grateful. No, it's the pleasure. The pleasure is all ours. I mean, look, at the end of the day, it's about it's about caring and sharing, right? And uh, if it's good, it gets played on gold dust. Let's just oh. say that. Oh, well, thank you. And as an independent, like fully independent artist, it's even more like meaningful. You know, I don't yeah. have a big record company that has millions to spend on marketing and stuff. So yeah, I had the radio plugger and then kind of it was a DIY PR campaign. Um, I got, a, you know, a few write-ups in some magazines like Echoes and stuff, um, which was nice. And, and you made it and you made it to, what was it, number 14 on the UK Soul chart? Yep and 11 on the global soul chart. That is yeah. quite some achievement yeah. for your first album. Yeah, uh, I, I'm flabbergasted and honored. And um, I was nominated as a UK artist of the year, um, I, just to lose out to Omar, which I'm totally happy with. <laughs> you can take that. Yeah, I can totally take that. You can take yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, yeah. Omar. Oh, he is, yes. Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> now, so it sounds like it's been a a, a brilliant journey. Um, the album went out. Obviously, we hit COVID, so you haven't been able to go out and perform and and really, really give that a, a bigger launch. But I guess yeah. with with um 
feeling pretty close. Yeah, there'll be some gigs and stuff. But just to take a little sidetrack away from away from the music, what other passions do you have? Uh, lots actually. I love animals. I wanted to be a vet when I was a kid until I found out I couldn't do the maths part. So that went out the door. <laughs> so like, oh no, I have to actually learn biology and chemistry to like, you know, fix animals. Oh, so one day I've, I've had animals my whole life. I just can't, we live in a very small flat. Um, but one day I'll have animals again. I love cooking. I love wine. Um, is there, a, is there a, a signature Sandra May Lux dish? Signature Sandra May Lux dish. Um, s any sort of like pasta. I, I'm on a pasta phase right now. And I just, mm -hmm. I just found out about this. Um, I know, don't freak out. It's a raw chili garlic parsley pasta. So you basically just heat up raw garlic, bird's eye chilies and parsley and a crap ton of olive oil. And you take the hot pasta and put it in lots and lots of Parmesan cheese, um, the tears of the gods, obviously, the pasta water. And it's just simple, but perfect. Yeah. You need to send me some recipes by the sound of it, Sandra. I will. I like, I like, I like pasta, but I'm not as creative, so I just tend to do the basics. Yeah. You know, do the, 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 the ordinary bolognese, um, the lasagnas. Um, the ordinary stuff. The ordinary, ordinary stuff. I see. Yeah, so I need some more creative ideas. That sounds good. Yeah, it's really good. Really good. So food, what else is there? I love the charity shops. When I came to London, I was like, <laughs> oh my God, these charity shops are amazing. Like, hey, this top I'm wearing was like a fiver at a charity shop, you know? And, and you I wear it well. Like, oh, thanks. And I feel yeah. like charity shops are the future because people don't need like more new clothes. There is enough. There's enough cool stuff out there for everyone. And luckily on my high street, there's like four in a row. So like once a week, I'll have a nice brow. I don't buy stuff all the time, but I do have a definite brows and that, that's definitely a pa passion of mine. And I love theater, obviously movies, TV, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, any, any box sets you've been watching through, what, uh, through lockdown? Oh yeah, um, we're just finishing Line of Duty. And that oh, is really? fantastic. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Really, yeah. Really good show. Really, really good. Yeah. How about Any you? others? Any others? Uh, what else have we been watching? There was one called uh, uh, Borgen, and it's a Danish show about politics, but it's incredibly exciting, which I didn't think would be possible. <laughs> 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 so, Oregon is a really, really good um, show about this kick-ass middle-aged woman running for uh, prime minister in, in uh, Denmark, which is, yeah, it's great. It's a great show. I might give that a little try. I yeah, how about you? Fun. What have you been watching? I watched, I watched quite a bit, actually. I watched um, the whole box set of Breaking Bad. Nice. Such it was, a good it, it show. It was one of those, it's one of those that I kind of put off for a long time. People... People said, yeah, you gotta watch it, you gotta watch it. And I, I had the time. So brilliant. I watched the whole complete box set of that. I watched another one called Power oh. as well. The box set of Power, which is uh, essentially uh, a guy who's a gangster, but he's trying to pull away from being a gangster in, in, in the US. Oh. But um, a good story with a prequel. Uh, 50 Cent is one of the main actors in it. Oh, I love 50 Cent. So uh, that, was, that was quite good. And I've just recently started watching uh, a Sky sitcom called Breeded, which is extremely funny with um, the guy, what's his name? Martin Freeman. You know Martin Freeman? Oh, yes, yes. He's very yeah. funny. Yeah. And, and he is absolutely brilliant in it. So I'm in the first series. At, well, I've just done the first series. So I've got about another three to watch. But oh. when I get the time, I'll, I'll finish what so. So, um, but that's enough about me. Let's talk more oh. about you. <laughs> oh. So... So um, we just got a couple left, and um, th this is another one that's a little bit of an on-the-spot question. Okay. What annoys you most in life? Is there something that really, you know, grinds your gears that happens on a regular basis? I think people who have no compassion, it really, it really bothers me. Like um, not being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes 
Uh, so basically, the <laughs> whole Tory party. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> am I allowed to say that? <laughs> and she never yeah, got a gig at a Tory party function again. <laughs> get it off your chest, go on. <laughs> yeah, so people with no compassion or, um, you know, ability to, yeah, um, feel what someone else or, you know, have. Yeah, compassion for people. Compassion. Just, no, just don't be a dick. It's not hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's really not hard. <laughs> That's basically all of the Ten Commandments in in one one go. Yeah, you are. You're definitely, definitely on my tip. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, my my last question to you then yeah. is, what next for Sandra Maylott? In Very, terms of yeah, music, in terms of music, in terms of um, performances. Um, well, very excitingly, we've we've just been writing, writing, writing new tunes for the new album, and uh, that's been a fantastic, amazing process and another lifeline through lockdown. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, we've upgraded our studio, um, so we have a, a kick-ass microphone, and and um, our setup is like really, really nice to record demos in, which is always nice, you know, to, to present a demo in like the best light you that you can. So it's been a joy recording those. And I feel like our writing has has kind of just bumped up a level as well. You know, I think lockdown and the COVID and everything has kind of given us a lot to write about and reflect about. Uh, so that's really exciting. I'm not sure when we're going to start recording. I was going to ask the question, or was? Yeah, I know. So it's very, very expensive to record an album. Yeah. And um, so please um, tell people that us musicians, the only way that we um, can make money to be able to pay for recording costs is if you buy buy our music. <laughs> don't stream. I mean, stream it, but also buy it. I don't care buy if you it, buy yeah. my CD and throw the CD out. The, the fact that you bought it, it and the money goes you know, straight to me because I'm independent. So um, it won't be going to some. It know. must be, it must be so difficult being a performer now to actually make money from the hard work you're putting in because of the streaming services that are out there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's killed us. And I'm, I'm actually not sure how we're going to survive. I think patronage is maybe one of the only ways that we're going to be able to survive. Um, yeah and buying buying music and and you know paying to come see us um in shows because streaming I'll, if i showed you what my spotify numbers were in a month it's like 0.002p 0.003p 0.00p because those are the people with the free subscriptions so you know i've made like what a fiver maybe from that's like crazy that's from crazy like eighty thousand streams so yeah. It's got to change at some point, hasn't it? It's got, it's to, got to. It's got to. Because then, there's your, then you're just not going to get music anywhere. No mm -hmm. one's going to have the money or the resources to, to be able to put music out. So there's going to be, you know, so something's got to give. And I, I think, I think it's going to come soon. I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. I've yeah. got one last question then. Yeah. One last one. The yeah. final one. Yeah. Final Does Sandra Maylux look the mask and feathers? Talk to me about that because I love it. Oh, thanks. Well, for me, um, having been through sort of the, being a female in the music industry is, is, is a bit different, uh, different, maybe perhaps slightly different experience than, than say a guy would have. Um, there's so much pressure on how you look, so much yeah. pressure on what size you are, so much pressure uh, like you have to look perfect, look a certain way, sing a certain. Quite sad, way. isn't it? Quite sad. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to nullify this, and I'm just going to. No one will see what I look like, you know, because for me, it's not about what I look like; it's about what the music sounds like. Absolutely, and yeah. that's the most important thing. And so, if I have this, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm kind of creating an even playing field, if you will. Yeah. Um, with this and this this mask idea it's a venetian mask it comes from venice it's um it has big black feathers kind of all over it and the, the silver kind of uh, yeah around my eyes and um it kind of came to me in a dream i have to say again you know one of those things i was like oh, how am i gonna make it so people won't see me and i don't want people to like you know 
And then this, this idea popped in in a dream and I thought, well, <laughs> look up Venetian masks online and boom, <laughs> there you go. No, I like it. I like it and I, and I like the whole thinking behind it as well because you're absolutely right. It shouldn't, it shouldn't matter how you look. Mm -mm. When you hear stories about people who have been told to change their appearance and stuff for marketing purposes, yeah, it's just not right, is it? And it's, it's almost always the females that have to keep on changing their appearance. If you've seen the changes that Lady Gaga has gone through or Ariana Grande or like any pop star, these females or Taylor Swift, they're con con and Madonna, they're constantly changing their look. But like, you know, there's Keith Richard and, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> whatever, same, um, same thing. So, yeah, that's basically, that's that. Well, look, it's been it's been wonderful to have you on the second part of Behind the Tunes. Aww. It's been brilliant. Um, and all I can say is make sure if you if you get to watch this video, go and buy Sandra May Lux's album. It's just a, br a brilliant listen. Oh, it's, thank um, you. It's real feel good music, feel good summer music. We really look forward to the next album, Sandra. So make sure. I get a little poke that is coming. You will get the preview before anyone else does. <laughs> get me a little poke and uh, we'll, we'll get our DJs playing it on Gold Dust Radio and um, our sister station, which is called Indie Soul Radio. They really do focus on the independent artists as well. So um, I'm really they're, they're, they're based in the US. So they'll be breaking lots of music out there for for the independent artists as well. So it's brilliant. Absolutely thank brilliant. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for, yeah, thank you. We love you, Sandra. Thank you very much for being on here for us. Thank you, Dino. We'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep you posted on everything music-wise. Definitely. God bless you. God bless you too.